Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to turn to our Bible reading now. Uh, you'll find that uh, on the screen in front of you in the service sheets you might have printed off, or you can turn it up in the Bibles that you have at home. Our reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. Matthew 11, 25 to 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, Because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened and I'll give you rest. All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is a word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's a brief outline under uh, that passage, and uh, it only has uh, a small number of points Uh, It's an opportunity for you to take notes. Uh, If you have questions or feedback or any queries, please use the comments box at the bottom of this webpage and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, Jesus has just confronted the crowd around him with his identity, hasn't he? As John the Baptist asks him, who are you? Jesus makes clear that he's the end point of God's plan to deal with human sin to bring God's approval to a broken and rebellious world. We've heard that time and time again over the last few weeks. Those listening to Jesus at this point, and we looked at this last week, are confronted with the very stark reality that to reject Jesus and his amazing words and works is to invite eternal condemnation. Those statements of woe, verses 20 to 24, that finish the previous section, should cause us to pause and consider what's actually going on here. What might have been the reaction to Jesus? On one level in the crowd, there would have been immense consternation on the part of many listening. After all, eternal condemnation for rejecting the deeds of a freak show whose ancestry is doubtful sounds a little harsh. And there might have even been outrage amongst the Jewish community listening as their relationship with God was questioned. Their status as God's chosen people was brought under scrutiny. Conversely, those listening to Jesus who have become his disciples might have been similarly disturbed but for a very different reason. After all, if even Jesus and his amazing life-changing miracles and words could not bring three towns to genuine repentance a genuine change of mind, what hope did these disciples have? And this against the backdrop of even John the Baptist being puzzled and the 12 heading off to a mission that Jesus has told them will be profoundly painful and heart-rending and difficult. And flowing out of those questions is the obvious observation, well, not even Jesus was always successful in his evangelistic efforts, if we can put it that baldly. Even Jesus was resisted, rejected, reviled. I want to suggest that all of these questions, all of this confusion, all of this doubt and consternation might have been taking place because at this time, did you see it there at the beginning of verse 25? At this time, there is suddenly a remarkable prayer from Jesus and then an invitation offered to those listening. The structure of the section is quite clear. Verses 25 to 27, Jesus offers a prayer. It's a vertical interaction that the crowd observes. And then in verses 28 to 30, flowing out of that, Jesus looks at the crowd and offers an invitation with two commands, a horizontal interaction. At that time, Jesus gives the crowd a glimpse into the relationship he has with his father, their distinctive roles and identities, the the invitation that then flows out from that. I think that this prayer and revelation and invitation emerge because Jesus is answering 
The, the word is there in the original Greek text, answering a series of questions and consternations, doubts and arguments that might have emerged from his statements of woe and his rejection in these three towns. On the one hand, as Jesus prays, we see a great reassurance, a great certainty. The assurance or the reassurance is that the Father is the one who works these things. And the certainty is that if you want to know the Father, you do with the Son. Now, on the other hand, in the invitation that Jesus offers, the Son shows his compassion, his all-encompassing concern. He turns to invite all those in front of him to come and know God the Father through him and so to have rest. We're going to look at that now, so let me pray. Oh, Father, these words, this prayer and then this invitation uh, are really a remarkable ending to a very tough section of Jesus' teaching. Uh, it's not really what we would expect to be happening at this moment, but it is what your Son, who is God in the flesh, speaks. And so we pray that we'll take these words as they truly are, a divine revelation of the very nature of the Father and the Son and their relationship and how it flows out to us. Father, please transform our minds and hearts as we deal with these words. Please work them on us by your Spirit as we understand them. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two at the outline. At that time, uh, it's so important to grasp the context for this prayer, isn't it? At that time, we're meant to think, well, what's going on? And let me just quickly remind you, Jesus has just pronounced woes of judgment on the towns of Bethsaida and Chorazin and his home base of Capernaum. They are condemned because they have not repented. Remember last week, they have not changed their minds, adjusted to the new reality in front of them that is the kingdom of God coming. God doing exactly as he promised to roll back sin and bring blessing. They have not repented when they've been faced by Jesus in the flesh, preaching and teaching and doing amazing deeds. But contained within that judgment and that woe is a startling revelation, I think, if we pause and think about it. Jesus is rejected. He's ignored. His advances through the amazing works and deeds are repudiated. People say to Jesus, even though you've done these things and said these things in my very presence, I reject you. How does Jesus deal with that? I mean, we know the feeling, don't we? Uh, be it family, friends, acquaintances, work colleagues, many of us have done everything physically, emotionally, verbally, uh, spiritually possible to put Jesus in front of these people dear to us. And these people reject the good doctor outright for me. And let me tell you that I'm a man remarkably unsuccessful in evangelism, telling people about Jesus. For me, it's profoundly disheartening and discouraging. I scratch my head and wonder, what have I done? What could I have done? What could I have changed? How could I have been more persuasive? Now, I don't want to downplay those kind of introspective questions because I think it's worth doing. It's good to ask yourself those questions at times. But how do you deal with the fact that the very person, words and works of Jesus himself were rejected outright, dismissed, ignored. How does Jesus deal with that? I'll look at verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. Did you catch what Jesus is doing there? In the face of this rejection, and the reality of the possibility of eternal condemnation coming on these people, the sadness that would have gripped him as he sees people reject the answer to their rebellion and brokenness, Jesus prays a prayer that thanks his Father and praises him. That's remarkable. Why does he do it? 
I suspect that he wants us and the crowd to see things from a top-down view. The revelation of the knowledge that reality has changed, that God is fulfilling his promises in your presence, that revelation can only be applied, grasped and understood when God the Father works. It's never a revelation that we grasp with minds that are our own because our minds, our bodies, our lives, our spirits are dead in sin, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It's never a revelation that we by nature want to know. I mean, who wants to know that they've been dethroned and another king has been crowned? It's never a revelation that we come to by logical conclusion or deduction especially when our minds and our hearts are darkened by sin. It's not a revelation that we deserve to know. It's not a revelation that we deserve to grasp of our own nature. After all, we are by our own nature under the judgment and wrath of God. In that sense, I think Jesus is making clear that the process of coming to know God the Father, coming to know Jesus as the King, is not a natural event. It's a supernatural event. It's a gift by the revelation of God to those who at that time only deserve his condemnation and eternal wrath. That God down view brings us face to face with God's normal method of action. He gives humans what they don't deserve at the very moment they should receive the eternal judgment they do deserve. In that sense, the proclamation of these things, repent and believe because the kingdom of heaven is here, the proclamation of these things is the job of humans as seen by Jesus and the job of applying that proclamation is the job of the Father. And that's in line with God's will and desire, his good pleasure his plan. In that sense, the consequences are at least two. First, there is an immense safety net, for want of a better phrase, for the people of God here as they go about their job. Remember the the job of the people of God? Remember we've talked about this over a number of weeks and months, that the job of God's people is to represent God to the world. We see Jesus doing that perfectly here, don't we? The failure of people to respond with repentance Well, we need to get this in the right perspective. The application of the truth presented can only happen when God the Father acts, which means secondly, which means secondly, coming to know God as the Father through Jesus the Son, coming to know God as the Father is always by God's amazing grace. It's never by our ability, intelligence, goodness, willpower, heritage or education. It means that knowing God as Father through Jesus the Son is always by grace. The gift of God at the very moment when within his very nature he could justly wipe us out. There's another conclusion that's worth remembering. And it actually is a warm conclusion, a heartwarming observation. It's by God's grace that anyone comes into God's family. It's by God the Father's action that anyone comes in. There is a great assurance here in the action of God the Father. It's not a matter of division. (laughs) Look, I've understood this and you haven't. It's a matter of assurance. It is applied by God the Father in his goodwill and pleasure and the goodwill and pleasure of God the Father is never moved. It's never bought. It's never manipulated. And it always achieves its purpose. Isn't that a wonderful prayer by Jesus? An insightful prayer. It is a reassuring and assuring insight top down of the work of the Father through the Son. 
Well, it then moves to a a revelation, if you like, of the relationship of this son and father together in verse 27. I'm at point three on the outline. And the prayer itself closes with a very clear statement by Jesus of where you need to go if you want to meet God. Uh, Look at verse 27. All things have been entrusted to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father. No one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son desires to reveal him. Here's a reaffirmation. Well, we might call it a crystal clear affirmation, if you like, of what Jesus was saying back in verse 10. God in the flesh is standing in front of you. Any question about Jesus' identity, any question about Jesus understanding his own identity is laid to rest at this point. Jesus is uniquely placed to do this job because he is in in an intimate and personal relationship with God as his father. In light of Matthew 10, 20, You couldn't miss the connection of the whole Trinity working here, Father, Spirit and Son. And if you want to deal with God, you got to deal with Jesus. Let me say that again. If you want to deal with God, you got to deal with Jesus. To deal with Jesus, to listen to him, to respond to him, to be attentive to him, to be confronted by his identity revealed in words and actions. To deal with Jesus is to deal with God. God has granted Jesus all the things that he has done, all the things that he has said, all the things that he does now. And in that, Jesus knows God and is God in a way that is truly unique. And Jesus' desire is for people to know God through him. I think that's part of what he's saying as he makes clear that his desire is to reveal these things to people There is a wonderful and relieving certainty here. Jesus is the only way to know God as God truly is. It's a wonderful certainty because it means that you, me, any person can know that if you listen to Jesus, if you respond rightly to Jesus, you are dealing with God the Father through the Son. It's a relieving certainty Because it means that as we do our job as God's people, remember representing God, all we need to do is place Jesus in front of people. The key to knowing God is knowing Jesus. The key to coming to God is through Jesus. The key to dealing with God is dealing with Jesus. So all we must do as God's people is to introduce people to Jesus. Now, uh, let me just go off on a slight tangent here. We're not to introduce people to the Anglican Jesus or the Baptist Jesus, or the Pentecostal Jesus. We'd introduce people to Jesus as he appears in the word of God, in the Gospels, and as he's unpacked later on and as he's promised before. Our job is to put Jesus as he is in front of people. It seems to me that Jesus then goes and shows us or his listeners back then, what that might look like. I'm at point four on the outline. Look at verse 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me, because I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus seems to uh, move from a vertical interaction and then take everything that we've seen there and apply it horizontally, looking out at the crowd around him. And he extends a very clear invitation, doesn't he? Uh, It's all inclusive, all healing, it's delivered to all in front of him. Uh, It's such a clear demonstration, not just of what Jesus offers, but how to offer what Jesus offers. Jesus doesn't pause to consider who might respond. He looks into their eyes and goes, I'll talk to you. Given what he's just expressed about the attitude to his miraculous deeds and words, Jesus doesn't second guess how the crowd will respond. Jesus doesn't divide the listeners before the invitation is issued. Jesus just says, come to me and you'll find rest. The invitation is made to the weary and burdened. Now, we know that's all humans because we've all lost our rest when we sinned. Rest was lost to humans when we rebelled against God. Remember Genesis 3? 
And this is something that's really exercised my mind and heart a little this week. Perhaps it's because I'm a workaholic. Uh, what does this mean? Put simply, I suspect that it's connected to the truth that when you try to be God, when you're not God, not even capable of being God, when you try to be God, when you're not God, frankly, that's exhausting. It's beyond anything we can achieve, beyond anything we should even try or desire to be. Rest is to dwell in right relationship with God. And for us to seek to be God is to lose that. It wears us out. It burdens us when we try to be God because it's not what we're made for. And that, that, in essence, is what sin is about, the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. And when you try to be God and that's not who you are, it'll just leave you weary. It'll just leave you burdened. The invitation then is to come to God with God in his rightful place through Jesus, is to accept the new reality that God's king is here to live accordingly. Only then will there be true rest, true rest. And then Jesus unpacks what that might look like. Well, not what it might look like, what it does look like in the very next phrase. He issues two commands, verse 29. All of you, take up my yoke, learn from me, because I'm gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for yourselves, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. To have rest... To come to a place where your eternal future is sorted because your eternal verdict is sorted, to have rest is to actually come and be yoked to Jesus, to submit to him, to learn from him, to come under his control, guidance and lordship everywhere. It's to be his disciple, his wholehearted student follower. It's to come to the one who rules God's kingdom as someone who is no longer a try-hard God. It's to come as someone who has been thrown off their own throne and come to the eternal throne and knelt at it and listened to the king and come under his lordship. To be truly at rest is to submit to the lordship of the one who's come to deal with our sin who has compassion on us because we're broken, who's the final end point of God's relentless commitment to dealing with the sin of the world. Moreover, the rule of this Lord, this man who is God in the flesh, is a rule of humility and gentleness and compassion. It's at this point that we can recognise the reason why Jesus can offer such a broad invitation because he knows that the Father will be the one to apply the truth. His job as a human being, as God in the flesh, is to represent the Father as the Son who knows him best and truly, and the Father, God himself, well, he will apply that. Now, at the end of a tough section on the work of being a disciple of Jesus, this is a wonderful example of how to represent God well. It's to invite all and sundry to come to the one who'll give them rest. At the end of a tough section on how this message will be received, the essential warmth and compassion of the message and the one who represents God is displayed. Jesus offers rest for the weary, rest for the burdened, compassion for the broken. Jesus himself is full of that compassion and gentleness. At the end of a tough section that might cause the disciple of Jesus to quake and quiver, here is reassurance. The message we offer is Jesus and Jesus as he is. The substance of that message is rest, which sin robs us of. The application of that message is by God the Father himself. The way to display that message is in proclamation and practice, proclaiming Jesus and practicing the rest of sitting at his feet and submitting to his revelation of God in his words and his works. Let me pray. 
Father, I am weary from trying to be God. I am burdened from trying to be God. Father, convict me of the foolishness of such an aspiration. Bring me to the one who is God in the flesh, the king of all, even death. Yoke me to him. Help me to hear his words and have them applied to me. Help me to offer the one who gives rest by bringing people to God the Father. Help me to offer that to all I meet. And Father, give me the great assurance that because Jesus has done his job, I can approach you in a prayer like this as my Father and you will listen. Amen.